the shit like a grown up. Fucking lives, that's the biz when you know Hi, what's everybody. up. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Black Bird Podcast. Now, I am Bird, Chris down, Whitehead, and next to me well, is. You give down. your whole government. Shut the. Stop can doing I that. get through one intro without you interrupting me, Jared? Jared is my co host. He's also known as Black. We are the Black Bird Podcast. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Come on in, sit all down, tell me about yourself. Like my daughter do you now? Why well, ain't that something else? Jared, believe you have a topic for us. Hey. All of, and all Aries is so <coughs> eager to listen. I think Aries also has a topic for us. Aries, w- would you like the mic for now? <coughs> Thank you, Aries, for those words. Jared, topic, please. Uh... So, I don't know if you know what this month signifies. It is not only No Nut November, it is also No Shave November, but on top of that, it's also Movember. Now, I don't know if you are familiar of what Movember is, Chris, but essentially... Jesus Christ. I'm I'm very disappointed I, you didn't catch on, like, like immediately. Well, I was, I was like, what the fuck are you singing? Because you didn't say any words. You were just making noises. Because I don't know the words. And the only ones I know I can't say because I'm white. <laughs> well, that hasn't stopped you before. Well, yeah, but we're recording. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that you're in the public eye, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Public ear. Mm, well, it's, it's a visual. There, there's, there's a visual. Movember. <laughs> okay. Movember is a month where men you get to choose out, you know, what uh, what what facial hair you're going to rock for the month. But that is also to bring awareness to different types of male issues like, you know, cancer, uh mental not mental illness, um suicide prevention and just um you know, mental health for for men. This is Yay. kind of this is kind of our month for men to yeah. to talk. So all you ladies, how about you how about you take your problem somewhere else for right now? All right, oh. this, this is our time <laughs> to be taken care of. Um, and I know you know on the podcast we like to we like to joke around a lot, and eventually you know we'll the next episode we'll get back to the to the fun and games and stuff. But for today, I, I thought why not have a little conversation about men's mental health. Seeing as how both of us are freshly out of college, where though that where it was one of the most mentally taxing four years of my life, I don't know about you, I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like uh, we have definitely changed as people, probably for the worse, but maybe for the better. And mm-hmm. so I was like, let's let, why not let's just take an episode just to talk about men's mental health for a while plus it'd be a good just like check in with your buddies to see how you're yeah. doing yeah so so chris and and despite what i said earlier um you know we we can argue whether or not women have it worse than men but uh uh depression is universal so in all seriousness uh yeah t- take care of yourself guys take care of yourselves guys and i mean guys in a very gender gender neutral uh fashion but uh yeah take care of yourselves if you feel like you need help, um, you do need help. So don't don't feel like that you're bothering people by asking for help. Because if you're asking your friends for help and you are bothering them, then you need better friends. You need better friends. Yeah, let me tell you, Chris is always bothering me at, at the wee hours of the night whenever I lived here. I'd just be chilling and Chris would just come and sit, on the, sit, uh, sit at the kitchen table and go, <sighs> I'd stop what I was doing. I was like, all right. Uh, step into my office. Yeah, but I mean, like in that, you know, we like we were we can we were taking care of each other's problems, and you take care of each other. You take care of if you have someone who is dealing with mental illness, uh, taking care of their problems are not actually taking their problems on yourself. And if they do that to you, then you're going to pretty much incur some pretty bad mental damage to yourself. Um, you're, it's not your responsibility to take care of other people's problems. We'll, we'll get into this more. Um, but, uh, yeah, don't take on other people's problems as if they're yours to fix, but be there for them and listen to them. And if they try to, uh, 
throw their problems onto you. Please just very, you know, assertively, but uh, calmly and delicately say, hey, you know, this problem isn't going to go away if you give it to somebody else. It's still your problem to deal with. I'll do everything I can to help you, you know, clear your head while you fix it, but it's yours to fix. I've known many people who um, uh, dug themselves in a deeper hole than the people they were trying to help by taking on problems that were dumped onto them that were not their own. Yes. Yeah. So so after, after all of that, you know, uh, get help. Talking is good. But so... Mm. So, Chris, I mean, now, granted, we talk a lot when we're not recording, but but um, it's been a while since, you know, we just sat down and we just talked when we weren't just joking around uh, and riffing. So how are you? How are you doing, Chris? How, how are you doing, buddy? Well, um, uh, for the past month or so, I I thought that uh, quitting my job would make things easier uh, for my mental health. And in a way it did, but I soon learned that um, the the root of my problem was that I was still burnt out from that whole last year of work with school, and uh, I was burnt out with some bad friendships and uh, some bad things that happened in my family, and I've always grown up with a mentality that, you know, if something bad happens to me... Uh, I got to get over it in the moment. Like it's gone after that moment has passed. It's gone and I need to move on. I don't think, I think for a year I kind of told myself that I moved on and I never really let myself actually rest from it. And, uh, it just, I don't know for this past month, I've been trying to be productive, but I keep hitting a wall and then I keep, um, I keep, hating myself and berating myself for hitting a productive wall when uh, the whole point of me, you know, being unemployed for a bit was to actually let my, give myself a break. And I never really gave myself a break, but even though I'm actually, I, I started, I picked up a, a part-time job. Uh, I feel like that I'm, I'm actually allowing myself to, to really breathe and not really, like I am being productive and I am working and I'm not necessarily working on the things that I think I need to get done, but I, that's exactly what I've kind of done for myself right now. I've told myself, Hey, you don't need to get anything done right now. You just need to, you need to reset. You need to actually reset for a bit. And so, I don't know. We'll see how that works, but I, I feel a lot more clearer than I did, um, for the past few months. Well, that's good. Um, I feel like a lot of, when a lot of people kind of hit that that bump, it's 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 a weird transition from for a lot of people from from college to like the uh, I, in quotations the real world. Yeah, you know, and not a lot of people are able to make that adjustment smooth, if any. And so I, whoopsies. I definitely feel quitting your old job was was probably the best for you because just going by of what you know you've you've told me uh, does not seem like a very mentally sound place. It wasn't to work. It wasn't. I loved everybody there, and um, and I've already talked uh, enough. But uh, to give context, the place I was working at actually was a video editing job. It had something to do with my field. So when I quit it, I felt like I had failed myself. Cause I'm like, ah, I quit that. So I can DoorDash and work at Walmart. What the fuck did I go to school for? But really, and I was, and, <clears throat> uh, my, I was actually talking to my dad, um, a few days ago and turns out, um, he's going through the same thing. Like all, all his life, you know, he, he was a mechanic and that's what he loves doing. He loves working on cars. He loves flying planes, anything that moves, anything that takes you from point A to point B, whether it's a train, it's a plane, it's a car, automobile, he, or an automobile. <laughs> yeah. Great movie. Thanksgiving. Um, uh, that's his passion. But recently he, he has been, um, you know, 
doing work that has to do with truck driving, which is something that he's always wanted to do. He's he's always wanted to fly a truck drive and work on cars. He's worked at he worked at Toyota for seven years, and then he got to the point where like you know what I I kind of want to I'm you know I'm in my forties I want to do something different now, and so he's truck driving, and uh, he's been miserable doing doing those truck driving jobs, and we we were talking about it. And it's more so like it, it. It's the I. It's it's coming to the terms that like you could be doing a job that's in the field that you love, and you're doing something that you know you normally love doing, and it, it's not always going to be, you know, the job you want. Like I I I don't really know how to explain it, but like when you get to that point to where like you go in and do something with the expectation that this is what you're meant to do and it doesn't work out for you, you think that you have failed yourself. No, it's just one, you probably do need to genuinely take a break. Um, or two, it, it's, it's the environment, not the occupation. It's, it's either the pay or the people or the way things are running or, you know, you're like with me, it was more so that like I was in the profession of video editing, but I was video editing, um, like doctor's procedures, something that I didn't really care about and something that I was required to learn about. And I didn't really have any interest in it. I love the people I worked with. Um, the structure was terrible, uh, because they didn't know what a video editor was. They thought it was an animator, a, a graphic designer. And you, well, recently you, you encountered that you applied for a job and, and, they asked for five years experience of, of Premiere Pro, which is what you had. And then it turned out all they wanted was a graphic designer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the thing. If you're going to employ a video editor, uh, first of all, if you're, if you're um, offering a full-time position of a video editor, or if you're offering a full-time position of anything, don't make the wage $300 a month. That is not even part-time wage. <laughs> well i'm uh, talking to someone specifically yes but yeah. i'm not going to say who it is but yeah. yeah no don't don't do that and that's the thing like the person that i'm talking about is pursuing their own career that's something super ambitious that you are not planned that you're not prepared for if you are offering a video editor a full-time position you're offering 300 dollars an hour Th an this, hour yeah sorry 300 <laughs> sorry 300 dollars a month 300 dollars an hour that's yeah that's an that's, that's, that's standard it. rate that's union rate i would have taken it yeah no but like what, what i'm saying is that's the example of you of a up-and-coming youtuber who wants to be a youtuber and they're offering 300 dollars for a full-time position of video editor to make 15 videos a month you're not prepared you're 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 being overly ambitious Start very small. Make one video a week. Make one video a week, Chris. Make one video a week. And that's another thing. Like, I plan to make, I like this whole summer, I plan to make like two to three videos a week. And in doing that, there were weeks that we were just silent because I had taken on way too much and I burnt myself out. And then I hated myself for burning myself out. And so I just wasn't productive. Um, and I guess that's what mental health is, is, is actually, you know, planning things out and, and listening to yourself. Also sleep. Yeah. I've talked too much. I'd say you, uh, apart from, well, no, go ahead, Chris, you know, speak your truth, big man, because as, uh, I came across recently, I was listening to a different podcast and this, uh, and it's, he's a, he's a husband now. He's a, he's a new husband. He's a, a young father. And he was talking about the struggles that he faced during the uh, during the pregnancy. And I was like, now granted, like, yes, you know, women, they, they go through through the mental and physical struggle of pregnancy. But it's like, that's not to say that men don't also go through something during that pregnancy. Uh, and he was talking about it was like how he felt like his opinion didn't matter or that he was invalidated because she was going through so much stuff. He felt bad for feeling bad he felt bad for having problems mm -hmm. and and i feel like for a lot of men we we do that to ourselves we feel bad for 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 having some type of emotion you know because it's 
not in our nature to have emotion. We're not supposed to be sensitive. Yeah. We're not supposed to, we're supposed to be able to, to brush everything aside as if, as if it was nothing. And so he was talking about with his therapist and his therapist, who was a woman, she was like, that's really dumb because you're sure you're, you're a man, but you're also a human being as well. Yeah. And it's like, you know, yes, your wife is going through physical and mental struggles, but so are you. Mm-hmm. And you should feel her just as much as she is because you are also a part of the marriage. You know, you're also a part of the family. So when it, so stuff like this, you know, um, it kind of, it kind of sticks out to me as, as someone who for the longest time did not believe in, in mental health really, uh, for yeah. the, for the longest time, I was like, when people are like, Oh, I just need to focus on my mental health. I was like, okay so you want a day off (laughs) yeah yeah i guess it was like that just it just seemed like an excuse to not do anything that's how i viewed it for a while too until i hit that brick wall of you know after years of that mentality of not listening to myself i hit like a really hard brick wall and i'm like oh shit yeah no this shit's real yeah well you know i've always thought there's like mentally i feel like I've always been pretty mentally tough. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I was like, maybe I just had like a higher, I don't know, like thresh pain, mentally pain threshold, mental pain threshold, whatever. I was like, I felt like I could deal with a lot more stuff. But when I finally met, reached my breaking point, uh, it was an experience that I've never, that I will never forget. And honestly, it I still think about it to this day. Now, for me, it was in college. It was like our senior year of college. And, you know, finals were coming around the corner. And the whole year was just busy. Uh, we, we just didn't have a lot of time to do anything. It and was beyond busy. 48 hours a weekend. A weekend. Yeah. 48 hours a weekend. And I was taking on more than the average college student. Most people take 15 hours. Some take 18 not many take 21. Yeah. I was, I was taking yeah. 21, 21 hours. Um, on top of that, uh, I was also editing four senior practicums as well as writing my own practicum as well as writing a 90 page feature length script. So I had a pretty full plate and as we got closer to like, you know, the, the deadline day, um, I like, I just remember staying awake for, was it three nights in a row, four nights in a row? It was, it was, uh, and one of our, and Geiger's, uh, our friends, mutual, our mutual friend's apartment four nights straight in his apartment, just editing. Oh and, yeah. I remember writing. that. It was me and you editing yes. and, and writing yes. cause we had the same assignments. Yes. For four straight days, uh, and I think in those four days, we slept maybe like five hours. We took a quick power nap before advanced <laughs> uh, the next day. And that was it. That was all we slept in those four days. Yeah. And I, on the final day, I was, we, were, you know, we were all trying to turn in films and whatnot. You had to turn everything in before midnight. And we, I was having problems because... So the hard drives weren't working. Mm. The footage from hard drives didn't transfer over properly. You know, uh, films weren't finished yeah. for one reason or the other. And when your assignments are like 15 minute short films, you're not like waiting till the deadline to finish it. You are working to the deadline to finish it. Yeah. And so it, it, was, it was just pedal to the metal yeah. constantly. And this last day, where all of the films were due, I just remember leaving Geiger's apartment, stepping outside, and I was like, it was it was a feeling I've never felt before. It was like anger, but it was like I'm more angry at myself for not finishing, and I'm also angry at myself for I want to say like letting people down, but it was like I feel like I I just I I just felt like I failed myself because it was like oh. Yeah, I can definitely do this. I can definitely edit for senior uh, practicums. I can definitely do that. And then only barely being able to finish 
two and a half of them. Yeah. I was like, man, I, I feel like I really dropped the ball. Mm-hmm. But then I have to remember, it's like, I did, there was a cut, I put out a cut for all four of them. And I think that's that's something to be proud of. But you it was like, did the most work that anyone did that semester with the same amount of recognition and, and credit, Jared. Yeah. You you did the most than anybody did. And that's the thing. Like, even if you fail, which I don't think you failed at all in any respect, but even if you fail, like, take a moment to take a step back and actually acknowledge what you have accomplished. Because, I mean, because I was like that too, but Jared especially, because he, 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 I mean, right off the bat, you, you took, you overestimated yourself and what you could take on. And that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to have confidence in yourself, but it's a bad thing to have confidence in yourself. And then those expectations were already, you know, so like, you know, unrealistic. And then you don't meet that even though you, you know, over met the requirement and then you beat yourself up, take a step back and acknowledge what you have accomplished, no matter if you do drop the ball on something. Well, yeah, but a a big part of that has to do with the overestimation is, you know, uh, everyone has one. Everybody has an ego. And so it was like what originally I didn't I had I did not plan on doing on doing four. Originally, I only planned on doing one, maybe two. And then, you know, the other two came in. And then when uh, when a professor was like you can't do this. This is too much. Then I was like, okay, motherfucker. Yeah. Fucking yeah. watch me, yeah. bitch. So, you know, it's like, you know, kind of, you, you you fight my ego and I'm going to fight back. It's yeah. just because, you know, I just, I feel like, you know, I, it's just one of those things, you know, as, <laughs> as a man, you know, I feel yeah. like I, it, it, if you're seen as weak, if you don't fight back. So I was like, okay, motherfucker, then why watch? I'm about to, I'm about to prove you wrong, bitch. With that, Jared, do you think that you find taking no for an answer uh, hard for yourself? Uh, I did. Oh, or, I, sorry, saying no, saying no to someone. I, I know what you meant. Yeah, I for a while I did. It was like I had a hard time saying no, but I think honestly, I think doing all of these practicums was the best thing to happen to me in yeah. terms of character wise because I've since learned how to you know, give projects to other people or just say, mm-hmm. sorry, I can't do it. I'm too busy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful because the, my plate has been much lighter, especially over the, over the, over the summer, you know, but you get into that, especially as an editor, you get into that mindset where it's like, I'm the only one yeah. who can, oh yeah who can make this, who can like bring out the full potential yeah. of this. As- I'm the only one who can do it. Especially when it's your own work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I've since then learned, it was like, you know, it, uh, swallow your pride, have a smaller ego, and then use it as an opportunity to prop up your other awesome uh, editors that you might know. And so it was like, uh, for for uh, for Geiger's short film that, that's coming out, originally he asked me to edit that, but I was like, at the time I still had to edit two senior practicums as well as a feature length short yeah. film, not feature length as well as a professionally made short film yeah. that I was a part of. And so it's like on top of a, a, another seven, eight, yeah. nine, someone seven, eight, nine, which and is a, a final yeah. for like juniors and sophomores. So I was like, I'm kind of booked, but Chris is good. And I took <laughs> it because I was still in the mindset that even though I was, you know, super like, backed up and I was still playing and other stuff. I was like, ah, no, I still need to prove myself and make something good. And yeah. Um, which I mean, we have a rough cut, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Geiger, if you're listening, I'm, I'm sorry that I've kind of dropped the ball on this, but, uh, yeah, I've through and during editing that and this is not an excuse but i would say during this uh the end of summer and the beginning of this fall i burnt out pretty hard pretty hard 
And uh, I think a lot of it just has to do with... I think what I got to do now is genuinely take a break and work on a plan to actually organize, not just, you know, work and projects, but just myself. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But as I've gotten... (laughs) I say as I've gotten older, it was only a semester ago, but as I've gotten older... Um, it has been easier just to say no simply because simply because yeah. like I I now I know what it feels like to be in like a, a constant loop of just constant work and I don't like that so I don't ever put myself in the situations again I'm never going to purposely put myself in a mm-hmm. situation where I suffer mm-hmm. and I didn't learn that until a few years ago yeah. where um for a while because I I thought it was the manly thing to do. You know, I'd always, I'd bottle everything up and I just, I take on everyone's problems. Not as, not as to like, not because I thought that I was, you know, Superman, but because it was like, uh, you're my friends and I really want to help you. Mm. And, uh, I would, I would take on everyone's problems and I would neglect my own. And eventually, um, my problems started to, to, to bubble over and eventually I couldn't help my friends anymore. Yeah. And so I, I had to do a lot of soul searching and I, I realized it was like, I'm just miserable. I'm, I keep putting myself in these situations that purpose that I know that are purposely going to hurt me, but I'm, I'm doing it to support my friend and, and sure that might be noble. It's also really stupid. Because if you can't help yourself, then you have then no you chance at help helping anybody else. else. Yeah. And so that and, that yeah. led to me, you know, kind of just taking a step back away from from everybody for a while. No, not forever. Just enough to like, you know, clear my thoughts mm-hmm. and you know do do some some soul searching. And I'd say college has been like four years. It's just been like a four year journey of me finding out what type of person I am. And. It took me like recently I I really allowed myself to to grasp that because um you know I've been doing this thing where I'm like ah I'm 23 at this age you know these YouTubers were already editing for like Markiplier and they already had like started their channel and they had got this many subscribers or at this age you know Kurt Cobain was already fucking don't compare yourself to other people because you are not them. And just because you haven't reached success at the same time they did does not mean that you are not going, does not mean that you're not going to be successful. Success is measured in the work you're able to do and the, in the highest quality you are able to do it to meet the vision that you have. And you can't do creative work if you are creatively burnt out. You can't do creative work if you can't use your brain, you know, um, same thing. You can't use physical work. If you are, you know, if your fucking leg is broken, if your brain is broken, then you need to let it heal, let it heal. Um, but yeah, no, I, I had thought that while I was in college, it's like, okay, after college, that's when everything needs to fucking start working because I like, you know, I was thinking like the time to find myself had already passed the moment I stepped into college. But no, no, I'm still finding myself. And I feel like it's a good thing to 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 consider that maybe you're always going to be finding yourself. And that's not a bad thing. It's good if you if your interests change, you know, and if your way of thinking change and if your view on yourself and others change it just matters how you view that change i guess yeah i i also say you know the to to the finding yourself thing i feel like the easiest way to find yourself is to talk which is kind of the whole reason of of this episode so Mm -hmm. it's like for those of you who might not already have someone like a therapist to talk to i would recommend find like a close friend or if you can yeah. go go get professional help and the thing <clears throat> that that I'd like to I feel like there's a common misconception about therapy I think for most people when they hear therapist it means like oh I have something mentally wrong with yeah. me uh, and if you and, and and if you don't have that then you're not good enough for therapy but I feel like 
at some point in your life, everyone's going to, everyone should go to, Mm -hmm. to therapy at least once. Now, as a, as a youth growing up, uh, in the household that I, that I grew up in, um, as you, as, as I've we said in previous episodes, uh, there is we got a long line of mental illnesses in my family, um, and as far as like I guess I was the most, I say again I say this in quotations I was the most normal one, so uh, I was denied therapy. I was denied therapy as as a child because uh, you know I didn't have schizo uh, schizophrenia I, I didn't have uh, ADHD I didn't have some type of of, of issue I wish is normal and so uh, I, I it, it took me a lot of it took a, a long time for me to do like some I was essentially my own therapist for for a long time because I hadn't I had no one to talk to I couldn't mm-hmm. talk to to my sister about it because you know she's in my mind she was the one that was suffering more than more than I was I couldn't talk to my to my dad about it yeah. because um, of you know, we're, I'm a black male. My dad was raised as a black male as well. And some of you might be able to, to, you know, um, what's the word to relate, but, uh, growing up as, as a black male in the black community, we're kind of always taught to be hard. You know, we're always taught to, uh, to not to be soft, kind of, you know, brush off your, uh, your emotions and, and all that stuff. So it's like, I can't, talk to my dad about this kind of stuff because even even now he'll he'll say this uh he always tried to raise me to be tough and mm. and I tell him it's like I ah, you 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 tried too hard you tried too hard you ended up doing a lot more damage than um than I think you intended to and you weren't you you couldn't help me figure it out because you never talked to anyone and that's not necessarily your fault it's just the way that we were raised you know you never had anyone to talk to so you don't really know how to deal with the problems that I'm dealing with and so now you've kind of left me to kind of pick up the the pieces on my own and and you've denied me uh therapy because I'm normal so it's like I I don't really have anyone to talk to so you know that's when I started mm. writing I think that's actually how Jerry was born. Now that I think of it, I think that's how Jerry was born. Yeah. Was just me talking to myself and then writing in, writing in, in, in a notebook. Mm. But, um, I've, so, and I've, now that I'm a grown man, I've honestly, for a while, I've just been considering finally going to a therapist. Um, just because now I feel like Nessa, I, I, I'm good enough for therapy. I feel like I'm good enough for therapy. Um, so I just, I just feel like it's long overdue and I don't think that especially men should be ashamed about going to someone else for help. You know, I feel like it's, it takes, it shows more courage and more strength to, uh, to ask somebody else for help rather than, than putting your head down and just barreling through it, trying to trying to fix it yourself. Yeah. Um, and also know it's also, I feel like it's also important to know how you yourself operate. Mm. Yeah. Um, I've never been an emotional person. Um, and I always thought that was wrong. Uh, like, uh, growing up, I, I was never big on like hugs and kisses and all that stuff, you know, or even the, the whole, I love you thing. And, and because of that, you know, my parents were kind of like, Oh, do you not like us that much or, or something? Mm. Do you not, do you not love your family? I was like, no, I love you. I just have a different way of, of, of showing it. Yeah. And then my, uh, my mom is like, well, the way that you're showing it isn't going to work for us. And I was like, well, I don't know what you want me to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what you want me to do. I, uh, as, as just, that's just the way that I do it. Um, but uh, since then, you know, I've, I've gotten over it and I feel like, focusing on like how you deal with like grief mm. or loss those are emotions that men usually don't process yeah you know yeah. because that usually that means crying you know and and as you yeah. know men don't cry yeah um yeah i yeah uh through this past year there there was a, a big instance uh, a big um event of grief in my life and uh it it messed me up for a, a a while, but um, 
especially while it was happening, I, I didn't cry. And, um, like I would, I would get a little emotional, but I, I wouldn't really cry about it. And I kind of felt like something was wrong with me. Yeah, it makes you feel, it makes you feel like a sociopath. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, it, it's weird. I, I think looking back, some of it might have been a uh, disassociation in a way, because especially when you're at a funeral, uh, especially if someone that was very close to you and that you knew very well, um, it's very hard to process the the idea that this is actually happening, that that's actually them, you know, and that they're actually gone. It's something that I still haven't fully processed. Mm-hmm. Um, and because, yeah, because I, I had a family member pass away this year. I had a best friend pass away a couple years ago and, and, and both times, you know, it, it messed me up pretty bad and still does sometimes when I think about him. But uh, yeah, grief, grief is very weird. It, it's very, it's very different for everybody. And that's something that I think in, in for, for many ways, like, you know, gr- like as, like as the way people show grief, the way people show love, you know, we have this preconceived notion that like every there's a universal way that everybody is supposed to show like grief and love and just well, other that's basic emotions. Of that's because of Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like like you were saying with with your parents, like ah, you don't show love the way you do, and that means you don't love us. It's like no, you got to realize that people got different brains. People think think and emote in different ways. Different is not bad, but it's harder to understand. So. What people naturally do is that when something is hard to understand for them, they force it in a way where it's easier to understand for them. And that's where you get really bad mental problems. <laughs> that's where, you, 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 yeah, you can't force someone to think and emote the same way you do. That's just going to fuck them up even more, especially if you are a parent. Don't do that shit. You're going to fuck your kid up. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> you know, it's it's okay. It it's okay. Speaking speaking from the heart, I just feel like if just have a little more compassion, people, um, and understand that people deal with things differently. Yeah. Now, uh, now I I do grieve differently than 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 a lot of people, mm-hmm. and a lot of people grieve differently than me. Um, and I I recently I was talking to my friend Ashlyn about this, and she's like, "Ooh, that's not good." And I was like, mm, "I don't know," because. Here's here's the way that I deal with it. So let's say um, when this happened, when my grandfather passed away, I think would it be like ten years now, mm. uh, around ten years, eleven years, passed away uh, about eleven years ago. Um, I was pretty close with my, with my granddad. Uh, he's the one who taught me how to shoot a gun. So I was pretty close with him. And when he passed away, I was like, I remember going to the funeral, and I was like, at the time, I was. F- filled with like a lot of different emotions. Uh, I would have been like 11 years old at the time, maybe 12, still pretty young, not necessarily a preteen yet. And I was just like, I, I just had a lot of questions. This is the first time I've seen a dead body. So I was like, I, I just had a lot of questions. A lot of things were happening. It was like, I was sad. I was upset. I was one. I, I wondered why he looked the way he did. It was just a, it was just a, it was just a bunch of, a bunch of things. And then, the very next day I was over it mm. and that's mm. kind of always been the case for me. It's like I, I get over it. I get over things extremely quickly. And that's what also makes me think that I'm a psychopath sometimes what because it was like, now I understand. And, and I say this every, what you should, you should 100% uh, process your emotions, whatever you're going through. You shouldn't, however long that takes you absolutely do that. Um, there is no uh, fixed time on emotional healing, uh, f- but for me, it's just much quicker. Um, and I think that has to do with just not liking the way that that being sad feels. So recently, by re- uh, like three days ago, uh, I was a bit depressed about a situation and I gave I <clears throat> what I do now and I do this because I know myself I'm not telling anybody else to do this this might not work for you but this works for me I've been I've been doing it for years and it for me it it works hmm. 
So for what I do is whenever I'm experiencing some type of like depression or grief, I say, all right, you have 24 hours, get this out of your system, do what you got to do, live in it, rethink it, relive it. You got 24 hours, no, no flag on the play, but tomorrow Mm. get up, get back on the grind, stop feeling sorry for yourself. And, and the reason why I say that is because for one, I hate how it makes me feel. I hate being depressed. I hate being sad. Well, I don't think anybody does. Yeah. But two, um, what's the point of, of dwelling on it forever? There's no mm-hmm. point. So it's just well, like, and again, take the time to process, take the time to process what you're feeling. Um, but after that go, yeah. I would say there definitely are some productive components to, to that method. Um, and again, it doesn't work for everybody for, I think it's a good time to, 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 um, say, and we probably should have disclosed this earlier. Um, we are not licensed therapists. We're film majors. Uh, I haven't really been to therapy, at least not in my adult life. Um, if if you are, don't take our advice to heart. Uh, if you are dealing with with depression, we just hope that you know hearing two goofballs on the internet openly talk about our experiences with depression will make you feel like you're not alone because in depression you're never alone even though it's a condition that makes you feel alone please know for for whatever it's worth you're not alone you're not alone um but uh go going off of that um and 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 not being alone i think that uh one thing in your method that is good is allowing yourself a specific time to to actually acknowledge the fact that you are depressed and not repress it, not make yourself feel bad for feeling these things, not making yourself feel weak for feeling these things. Um, fully allow yourself to, to just be sad and actually listen to your emotions. Because I think a lot of, and again, not a licensed therapist, but I think a lot of what depression is, is you know, not being in tune with yourself emotionally, not understanding what these emotions are. And, and I think a part of what causes depression is just a buildup of emotions that, you know, you were, you were repressing or a buildup of, of emotions that you're not repressing and are just hitting in you in the face constantly, but you don't know how to deal with them because you've never had someone who, tried to you know deal with your emotions with you or just listen to your emotions with you um i think it's good to allow yourself to fully listen to yourself now the only thing with that method that i think is again you're you're different and you know how to listen to yourself but i i i don't think it is ever a good idea to tell yourself that at this time you need to stop you need you know, you need to stop being depressed. Don't force, don't ever force yourself to not be depressed. And I don't think that's what you were saying, Jared, but don't ever have that mentality that I'm depressed right now, but I shouldn't be. So I'm going to force myself not to be. That's going to make things worse. Don't ever do that. If you get to that point, have somebody listen to you, have somebody listen to you being depressed and say, Hey, it's cool that you, it's, it's okay that you are depressed. Let me let let me you know listen to you. Um, yeah, so I guess I can I, I'll clarify a little more on on that point. So, when, whenever I say uh, you have a day, that's me speaking as in the past it's only taken me a day, but in realistically speaking, what you know when I you when I do my twenty four hour uh, feeling session, the next day I might still feel a little sad or something, but I will still get up and I'll still go about my day. You know, the, 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 I think the biggest problem is we let the depression dictate when and what we do, you know, when we, when we work or what we do. So, you know, it's like, I'm not going to lay in bed tomorrow. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go do something. So for me, what I, what I'll most likely, what I, what I'll do is, um, I'll get up the next day. I'll go on a bike ride. I'll go work out. I'll go play soccer, you know, just something. And I think that helps something not to take your mind off of, off of it, but something to just kickstart, be like, all right, get your life back on track now. Cause I think that's what, what keeps like the depression going is you have no, nothing to kickstart you to get your life back on track. It's just, well, I'm depressed. I guess I'll just wait here until I'm not depressed. Mm -hmm. 
and I and I and I think I I believe that you're not at least in my case you, you're the only one who can tell yourself to stop being depressed. It's never just gonna come. It's not just gonna fall off the sky. You're you're going to be depressed until you decide to not be depressed anymore. Well, yeah, but you can't decide to not be depressed and just tell yourself don't be depressed and then you're not depressed because oh, yeah, you're not uh, yeah. fixing what is there that is making you depressed. And a lot of times you're depressed because you don't know why you're depressed, which is why listening to yourself and having people listen to you is what is what can help uh, the most. Uh, well, on that, I'll say, so a lot of, you know, oh, you're depressed because you don't know why you're depressed. I think it's the same thing as, I feel like you, you do know why you're depressed because you can't solve a problem unless you know what the problem is. You know, so it's like mm. you can't solve, you can't figure out what your depression is. You can't figure. <laughs> the okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it, and then we'll figure out the wording later. Okay, I know what I'm about to say might sound really bad, <laughs> but we're gonna break it down afterwards. Okay, <laughs> okay, you're not depressed unless you know why you're depressed. You know, there is a reason for your depression. Yeah, no, there's always a reason. So it's like, you know, it's like, oh, I'm depressed, but I don't know why. Uh, yeah, you do. And, and that, I just feel mm. it's like that's either you're afraid to admit why you're depressed or you're afraid yeah. to listen to your body. Because mm. your, your, your body and your brain, they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you why you're depressed. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I think it's, it's just scary to listen. Mm. It's scary to have to deal with that, and so we'll we'll say, "Oh, I don't know why," uh, and as as uh, as a scapegoat, either as opposed to I know why. I'm kind of just afraid. Well, yeah. Maybe because I don't have anyone to talk through it with, or uh, you know, I'm afraid to do it by myself. You know. I mean, that's fair, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, and, and I think disassociation is is a big uh, um, effect of depression. But I do think that it absolutely depends on the circumstances because, again, depression is not universal. The way it works, the way it occurs, the way it's healed, it's not universal. Well, absolutely. That's why, um, again, this is just yeah. my method. Yeah. This is my method. But I do understand what you mean by, you know, sometimes, yeah, you, you do know why you're depressed, but you, you don't want to accept that. And even if you do know, it's, it's hard to really fix it. Um, which is why just talking, just talking is the best way, is the best way to cure it. Be aware that you're depressed. Yeah. And be okay with being depressed. Don't, 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 okay, don't be content in being depressed, but be, accept the fact that you are. Don't let it, don't beat yourself up and say, no, don't be depressed, or, ah, shit, I'm depressed, I fucked up. No, 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 you just need to give yourself a break, bro just need to give yourself a break yeah and this is the last thing i'll say and then and then we'll wrap it up uh for the men out there uh who are who are listening uh please remember that while you are expected to be the uh the cornerstone and the pillar of 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 a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of any of a stable relationship remember that your mental health is also important and you yourself have value. And if if you're feeling some type of way, if you're feeling undervalued, maybe have a conversation with, with your loved ones and be like, hey, this is what I'm going through. You know, I feel this way about it. And I guarantee you, if they're worth their salt, they'll listen and, and they will do their best to adjust accordingly. Also, men, ask for help. We're not going to, we're not, I promise we're not going to make fun of you for asking for help. Yeah, that that's the biggest thing. And again, I don't think it is exclusive to men, but I uh, Yeah, but this is November, so we're talking to men. No, I know. I know. Today. Yeah, no. I don't think it's exclusive to men, but I do understand uh if people who are not men may think like, ah, you know, it's so easy to to ask for help. It's stupid to not ask for help. Why would it be so hard to ask for help? Well, you're right. It is stupid to not ask for help. But 
like Jared was saying, and 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 again, this this goes for you know this goes for everybody, but I think that it, it is definitely common in men, especially men who are raised in the South, and especially men who are you know raised in the black community. Uh, it, anyone who is raised with the notion that you need to be strong for other people, then you're never being strong for yourself. And if you're not strong for yourself, can't be strong for other people. And that's why that is very much associated with, you know, mental health and, and, and men, because stereotypically men are, you know, the ones who are supposed to be strong and be the emotional pillar for everybody else when, you know, where's their emotional pillar? And it's not there because, you know, a lot of times when men are going through emotions, they just tell themselves that they don't have any and to ask for help is weak. You're not weak to ask for help, man. You're not weak. You're going to get weaker if you don't ask for help. Yep. yep. Well, well, thank you, Chris, for, for sharing, for, uh, for sharing all of your, your, your mental health history. Yeah, and, I do appreciate it. You and know, I feel like it's yeah. good to have just like a check in with your bro every once in a while, yeah. you know, I feel like that's healthy just yeah. to, just to just see how they're doing at the end of the day. Listen to them. Uh, don't, don't, don't really listen to a therapist. Uh, don't take this as, as like, you know, your one therapy session, actually go to therapy and, and, and reach out to, to the people in your life and tell them, Hey, this is what's going on with me. You know, all right. Do that. Yeah. Well, all right. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you thank for you watching. Guys. Uh, we appreciate everything. Um, this concludes the first, uh, serious, uh, podcast episode. Yeah. But don't worry. We'll be right back on our, we'll be back on the grapes in the yeah. next episode. <laughs> we'll be back on the grapes. Throwback. <laughs> yeah. We'll be back on our dumb shit. So we'll see you then. Bye. don't forget. He's alive, let that motherfucker thrive I'm gonna get it on that um, um, till I find out what's inside I'll take the flame with some pain on the side He's alive, I know that, you can see And he gives like a silver stein tree